Good evening and welcome to the City Council work session, April 8th, 2019, first one after our spring break. So welcome back, everybody. It's good to be here. And uh, we will, uh, I, we, I'm expecting uh, Alan and Greg here. Uh, Claire has a work commitment. She'll be calling in for the 730 meeting. I'm not sure we'll hear from her for this meeting. So um, with that, I can open, uh, are there Items, items of interest or committee reports from anybody? Yes. Yep. Betty, take it away. Thank you. Okay, to start with, um, Greg and I were both in D.C., National League of Cities, recently. We met with our senators. We did not meet with Congressman DeFazio because we our plane left before scheduled the Oregon meeting with him, but we met with the two senators. Good. And... Um, I, Senator Merkley talked about housing, which is something we've been concerned with. He said that what he thinks we should do is support single room occupancy buildings with the bathroom down the hall. He said that he lived in such a place when he was young and it was fine. Um, and that we need shelters for people to get out of the weather. Those two things he th were his recommendations. And I thought, Actually, I totally agree. That's exactly what I think. But, but um, I thought that was interesting that he said those things. Um, and for another thing we should do about homelessness, I think, is try to persuade EWEB not to cut people's power off. It is, it is if you're if you can't pay your bill and then they cut your power off and say you have to pay a big fee to get reinstalled, you just cannot do it. And I think that that those that along with medical bills contribute to our homelessness problem a big way because I I know you just can't do it. If you if you can't pay your bill, you can't pay a big deposit. Um, I just took a I, I think that I talked to Senator Merkley about trains supporting Amtrak. And after that, I took a train trip, and even more so, I think we need to, we need to, if we have any influence with the federal government, we need to use that influence to support subsidizing, helping Amtrak. We do subsidize automobiles through the roads. We subsidize air travel, and Amtrak really needs money. They, they need money to repair their cars. They need money to repair their tracks. On the way back, I was about eight hours late, I think, something like that, because there was a broken rail and the train had to stop for a long time. And the rescue or the maintenance rig caught fire on the way. I don't know if that was a Amtrak thing or not, but anyway, um, I ended up having my last day on a bus. But the train travel was extremely, it's a it's a very good way to go. It's It saves pollution, It's, it's if we care about climate, the climate, we should support train travel. Uh, it also is good for people who live in small towns. We went through many small towns, and people who don't have easy access to rail, to flying, to airports, were, would get, get on the train. And uh, I, th I think it's just totally important to, to. My time is up. So anyway, I, if we could do anything, I did hear Nancy Nathanson uh, on the radio, and I didn't hear what she said before that, but saying, talking about train travel. And I think if the state legislature and the local uh, councils could lobby our national leaders, that it might help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take it away, Emily. Happy yeah. spring, everybody. Um, Speaking of trains, I was at one of the railroad crossings on my way to see Emerald Village last week, and we got stopped for seven minutes, and it was pretty much 98% oil trains. I looked up the picture online to make sure. Um, I counted for just a little bit, not a very little bit, and I got to 10 and gave up. So I'd say there's probably a couple hundred oil train cars coming through our town. It was a lot of them. They were all clean and spiffy but it was still scary. Uh, <clears throat> I have a kind of cool thing to tell you about. Well, a bad thing to start out with. My trees, the city trees, great big trees, give me a lot of shade. I love them, and 
two of them get really yucky looking leaves in the summer and the squirrels look like they're digging holes in there for condos. So I went to the website and there's a place for public works where you can report or ask for a tree inspection. And on there, there's a link to an interactive map of all the trees. So it's really cool. It's kind of like Google Maps. You can go and find your house. And yep, it had all four of my trees and what their names were and, and all that kind of stuff. So I just thought that was a cool thing that people might, might not know about. Um, I'm still waiting for that day center. It's been six months. I've been hearing about the building in the works for several months. And uh, publicly, publicly, once again, we need a downtown day center. And we need it six months ago, three years ago. So it's time travel quicker than that. Um, a concern this weekend with Saturday market opening uh, it was very rainy. We didn't have the crowds we might have expected. The expansion across the street from uh, farmers market and Saturday market really, really changed what was happening in free speech. Their uh, pop-ups have walls, so the old vendors, free speech vendors, didn't have any walls, and you could see right through uh, to the plaza and from both in and out, and now it just feels sort of like you're in a box. Uh, the rules changed a lot for the free, free speech vendors. They now have to have a $25 permit, can't have any canopies or umbrellas, and only a four foot square table. Uh, there was plenty of room because of the rain, but people were soaking wet, so was their stuff. Um, the older vets who always sell in the middle of the terrace were soaking wet and asking people to please buy their things so they could try to apply to be in Saturday market where everybody was under heavy duty uh, white pop-ups. So it came out with very little announcement. I, I'm really concerned about how it happened and I've been asking around to see who made these decisions and so far nobody knows. So I just thought everybody else might like to know about that too. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? So, oh, yes, John. Thank you, Mayor. Just uh, as I mentioned to the council in an email just last week, the Veterans Housing Project opened up their 10th home. You might remember uh, VHP was started several years ago, really as a, uh, a partnership between EWEB, the city, St. Vincent de Paul, and the Home Builders Association. And the idea was to uh, acquire single family homes, uh, get lots of volunteer hours and donations, and rehab those for veterans and their families to be able to stay in a safe, secure place for up to two years. And it targets those at 80% uh, of AMI or less. And uh, through the years, there have just been dozens of families that have uh, taken advantage of now 10 homes and uh, we have a, another one or two sort of in the queue that will be coming uh, open as well. And so partly uh, this one was in a partnership with Bethel School District. So just want to uh, publicly say thank you for uh, to them for this particular project as well as to all the volunteers and the sponsors of the project. Thank you. Um, I have just a couple of quick things I'm going to add. The first is that uh, Claire and I both serve on the MPC, and uh, a couple of weeks ago, the MPC had a presentation from a community activist um, who talked about Irene Ferguson, who was hit by a car on Hunsaker, and so the Lane uh, Safety Coalition and the city and the county have uh, really responded in kind of a rapid response to the dangers at Hunsaker and Beaver Lane. So it was very inspiring to recognize that we could do some, even before we do changes of the hardscape of that road, that there were some interim things that could be done around vests and crossings and information that's available. So, uh, you know, I think it's that commitment around Vision Zero is sort of kind of <coughs> raising everything up to greater visibility and more responsiveness. And, um, and then uh, in that same vein, I am going to Decatur, Georgia with folks from ELCOG and the city on a walkability conference. So again, um, this one is geared really towards health. I mean, it's, it's funded by the um, CDC, but uh, so hopefully we'll come back for, you know, meeting, I think there are a total of 10 communities going. So be able to come back with some fresh insights about our Vision Zero and our walkability and how we do that work. 
The uh, second point, um, I attended the um, uh, Prepare Out Loud emergency preparedness presentation at South Eugene High School on Thursday night. And I, if you get a chance to attend one of these in the future, this was an incredibly helpful um, preparedness session. Uh, really focused on the Cascadia event, incredibly helpful, useful, helpful information. They had a really good turnout, nice collaboration, and 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 you know very good checklist. So the city of Eugene has checklists on emergency prep, as does eWeb. You can sign on an eWeb pledge. There's lots of information out there, and it's very consistent. Whether you're following the city's checklist or eWeb's checklist, it's all the same information, and um, so. Just kudos for the to the um, the folks in risk management who prepared that, and to the maybe 200 people who showed up, which was really great. And then uh, just one more quick report. Uh, also, Claire and I are serving on the TAC steering committee, so we had our second meeting today, and we're just sort of crunching through at this high level in that conversation about how we'll sort of orchestrate that the implementation of those of those proposals, those recommendations. So that work is moving forward and coming to you on council on May 13th, I believe. So okay, with that, I think we are ready to oh, one more thing. Go ducks. It was disappointing about the women duck basketball team, but you know, maybe we have an opportunity to acknowledge or thank that they got as far as they did and they did us proud, right? Here in Eugene. So that was really great. Okay, um, onward the community safety initiative. Thank you, Mayor um, and Council. We're back tonight to continue the discussion about community safety revenue funding. Um, I'm Christy Hammett, Assistant City Manager. I'm joined at the table by Mauricio Botolico. Got it. And from Finance, uh, Chief Skinner from the Police Department, and Chief Salutic from the Fire Department. And our purpose here tonight is to um, continue the discussion. Um, the revenue source that we're seeking um, to fund is the dollars, $22.8 million uh, that are needed to provide the system plan support that uh, was presented to you last fall. Tonight is an informational presentation. We're looking forward to gathering as much information as we can back from you, but there's no action required tonight. And just to remind you, we had two previous um, meetings on this topic. One was on February 13th. On February 13th, you received an overview of the work of the Community Safety Revenue Team report that was reported to the city manager. At that point, we talked through some of the um, thoughtful and diligent work that the team did um, and how they arrived at the recommendation that they did for the city manager. At your workshop on February 23rd, uh, we returned with a more in-depth conversation about specifically about the three topics that they really delved into um, to give you a little bit more insight. And today we're going to we've uh, we're coming back with a possible payroll tax, a uh, community safety payroll tax structure um, for your for your input. And the thought is is that we'll use um, the information from tonight and then continue discussions with other communities as we move forward. Okay, so this is not this is not a new slide necessarily. We keep moving the moving the dial on this slide, and it says timeline. But quite honestly, I think about it as a progress slide because the timeline marches time. And actually, we've been doing uh, making some pretty significant process, progress over the, the last several years, dating back to 2016 and actually 2015. Um, council um, supported the launch of the CORT program, park initiatives, safety things, and um, over the course of 2017 and also added some more downtown safety expansion of cahoots. Those um, changes that were proposed uh, required about $6.5 million in investment. Some of those were one-time investment, some, some capital, but kind of was a really significant source of funding that infused into the community safety system to, get, to jumpstart what needed to happen. In 2018, just last year, it seems like a long time ago, but just last year, we had many meetings um, um, and thinking about how we move forward and really identifying what the problem is that we're trying to solve and what is what recommendation that we had coming back. And you might recall that last fall, we returned with the plan with the 22.8 million that I just mentioned. And so we closed out the year strong and continued the revenue work. This year, or really, in my opinion, it's it's the year of really figuring out the big solution to this revenue um, funding that we need for the uh, for this community safety initiative. And our plan is is after today, we'll return back in 30 days with a city manager recommendation. And with that, 
I'll turn it over to Chief Skinner. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Christy. Well, welcome back, Council, Council from your break. Um, it's uh, an exciting time to continue this conversation in the way of putting things in context uh, with how quickly time marches by. It was one year ago this month that you hired me as your chief of police. It's been a year now that we've been together. Uh, it's been the best year of my life. <laughs> and, I look forward to, and I look forward to many more. Um, you may remember before my arrival in February of uh, 2018, uh, then Director James came and talked a little bit about some metrics that I think were pretty shocking. Uh, I think it supported some of the conversation that had been happening since 2016, and I think just reaffirmed what we already knew is that we are definitely not trending in the right direction when it comes to providing a public safety and community safety atmosphere that is um, providing the high levels of livability that I think people expect and need in the city of Eugene. Uh, some of those metrics, just in the way of a refresher for anybody in the audience or watching that doesn't know, is the, the average number of calls for service that we can't go to each day um, is averaging right around the 80. And I asked for those numbers to be refreshed uh, a couple months ago, knowing that that information was potentially stale and we're still, st at, that, at that point, still right at that 80, that 80 mark, which, which oftentimes we know those calls for service are those lower acuity or lower um, level um, livability type calls for service. But nevertheless, there's people that feel victimized every single day that are asking for our help that don't see us or don't see us in a timely fashion. The second uh, metric is just how long it takes us to be able to service these calls and having those response times increase to an unacceptable amount. And I think the last piece that is important to, to point out and just as a refresher is understanding that in a police officer's life or uh, that as they try to serve this community, there's a balance of their duties that really, really speaks to um, a safe and secure and livable community. And that balance in the industry standard is right around 20, 20 percent of reactive time where you're responding to calls for service, 20% of administrative time so you can do the work you need to do around answering those calls for service and writing reports and doing those types of things. And 20 minutes of proactive time or undedicated time where you can actually spend time in neighborhoods doing the important things that you need to do that are that are so vital and critical to community policing and, and specifically vital to, um, to uh, delivering what's in the 21st century commu uh, community policing report that the pre that a President Obama commissioned. That's really, really important. Right now, we're at about 47 minutes of every hour of an officer's time they spend answering calls for service, and only about four minutes of that hour is spent in proactive or undedicated time. And so when you think about officers really wanting to do something different in a neighborhood, they just don't have the time to do that. And so part of what we're trying to accomplish is to, is to be able to move, uh, move, the, uh, move the needle and trend in the, in the right direction there. So just as a, as a way of, uh, from my perspective, again, having an outside chief does afford you the opportunity to, to have somebody that has, a, an, has been in another community, and in this case, a couple of other communities, um, um, looking at the types of things that, that occur in those communities when, when you don't have uh, public safety and community safety that is, um, is robust enough to meet the needs that the community has. And I would tell you that we're at a, we're at a place, we're at a, at a tipping point now with these metrics and others, but with these metrics that I think um, call for us to, to pay close attention to what, where we're at today and, and what we want to become in the future. And so I appreciate the ongoing dialogue. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chief Zalutik. He's going to talk a little bit about what we've been able to accomplish through the leadership of this council and Supplemental Budget 1 when they infused the $8.5 million, because I think it's informative to show what it is we can do when we're entrusted with public funds like that. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I want to take us back to 2017 when the Council adopted a budget that included the resources that would help with an ALS deployment, advanced life support, and basic life support deployment in this community. Uh, this funding dramatically helped our advanced life support capacity, and by adding the basic life support capacity, it allow us to take some of the low acuity calls for service, keeping our uh, calls for service for our critical calls available for advanced life support. Over the last three years, we've had a 20% increase in medical calls for service, and it was that decision then that's allowed us to uh, pace and improve uh, the system. 
Um, the basic life supports that we put in service can be turned into advanced life support units by taking the firefighter paramedic off the engine, putting them on the basic life support ambulance, and then increasing the level of care on the in route to the hospital. And it's been very effective in improving uh, some of our patient outcomes. Uh, I just wanna talk about that a little bit. In this community, over the last few years, we have dramatically increased walk out of the hospital survivability for witness cardiac arrest. That means when somebody sees somebody have a cardiac arrest, somebody stops to do CPR and they call 911. Over the last few years, we struggled to get to 50%, which is one of the highest standards in the industry. Our preliminary report on where we are today is 58%, which is one of the top in the country. And that's because of the increased capacity of having the closest advanced life support unit in the station closest to the event is dramatically improving some of our outcomes. We're gonna see some of our other outcomes improving such as stroke and chest pain. Uh, we recently have matched and improved on the national standard times that are recommended once you get somebody in the hospital to get them up into the cath lab and do some of the um, significant uh, improvements on their life like adding a stent or doing things of that nature. And so we are just starting to improve uh, those outcomes for stroke and chest pain as well. And this is critical to the community. And a few years ago, um, it was we were trying to get to those thresholds and we finally met it. Time is muscle for heart patients and time is brain tissue for stroke patients. This funding has provided the gift of time to some of the most critically ill and injured members of our community. We wanna thank you for that. Um, now talk about triage for low acuity calls for service. One of the challenges by having more resources in the field is that our emergency medical transport times have improved. However, we are now experiencing delays in getting our patients onto a hospital bed into the hospital. Some delays, and this is on a regular basis, are over an hour. Part of this plan will focus on rapid field triage that will allow a single unit to go out and evaluate low acuity calls for service so we don't have to send a full crew and a large fire engine for every call for service. Uh, this also includes a, um, a critical component that is needed by reducing those uh, that fuel usage. It'll allow us to meet some of our climate recovery ordinances um, goals that are cited and we have to uh, continue to reduce our fuel to do that. We will also introduce a 911 call center triage program that will help patients work directly with their primary care provider and the insurance companies to eliminate some of these transports to emergency rooms so those beds are available for our most critical calls. It's hard to think about fire season with the rain this week, but our urban interface calls, it's critical to get hose and out on off the rig and water onto the fire as soon as possible. And we have put more firefighters in the street by doing this and it is our intent uh, to make sure that we have uh, better response times and we have demonstrated that by having more people out on, on the unit, just having one extra person, and we usually add two with each medic unit, our hose is advanced about 25% faster and that's critical as we start talking about fires in the urban interface. And uh, this funding has also been a huge advantage because these uh, units are now remaining in their area more often and they're responding again from the uh, closest um, fire station to those calls for service. So with that, I want to turn it back over to Chief Skinner and he was gonna talk a little bit about uh, you know, how things are looking into the future. So with the eight and a half million that we had, I would be remiss if I didn't um, point out the fact that we've been able to hire five additional CSOs and they're answering more calls for service and we're continuing to look how, how we can actually match the response with the need and being smart about doing that. And so I'm, I'm ex excited to live in that space for a while and be able to analyze if we're making that dis difference. Uh, I think the more visible uh, difference that we've, that we've made lately is we have a street crimes, part of a street crimes team that's hit the street with a sergeant and four officers and you'll see almost on a weekly basis uh, the success stories of the types of problems that we're solving in neighborhoods, whether it be drug houses or some of the street level activity that we're seeing and the crime that we're seeing. And so they've been very, very successful. And I'm very hopeful that it fully built out with two sergeants and eight officers, we're really going to be able to make some differences for people that have been in crisis for a while in their neighborhoods in the downtown business area, and, and especially our retailers and, uh, and business owners out in West Eugene that's oftentimes feel forgotten. And so we want to make sure that we're paying attention, paying attention to them. 
Um, some of the things through the 22 and a half to 22.8 million that we're hoping to accomplish is really uh, be specific about creating outcomes and metrics for, for what we think we can achieve. Uh, we think we can, we know we can answer more calls for service with more staff. That's going to feel better for people. And the piece that's happening right now that really, really causes me concern is as I talk to people in, in different neighborhoods and different special interest groups is the level of complacency and apathy that this community has around calling 911. They oftentimes say, what is the point of calling the police when they're not going to respond? Now, right now, that means that maybe they're not calling police around low level crime, but I have to tell you that it, it is just a hint of things to come. And the question is, if you're not calling now, what are you not going to call on in the future? Does that mean that the domestic violence that you know that's happening next door, you're not going to call because you don't think we're going to come? And I know that's a dramatic example, but it's one that I think hits home when we talk about the trend that we're on with people choosing not to call 911 because they simply know that we can't come. Not to mention the data we lose in that. If we want to be truly an intelligent and intelligence and data-led policing agency, we need to understand where criminal behavior is happening. And we're losing lots of data points because people are not calling us. And we can certainly educate them and ask them to call us, but one of the ways that we can recondition people to actually call police is to actually be able to respond to those calls for service and respond in a timely fashion. And it doesn't always need to be a police officer. It can be another friendly face from EPD that can actually service their needs, but we need to make the difference now and start trending in the right direction on responding to calls for service. The other byproduct and outcome and metric is how quickly we can get to them. People get less frustrated when we can respond and get there quicker, and we can, we can absolutely change that metric with these resources through this, through this community safety initiative. And then lastly, with more police officers, with more support staff, looking from a systems pr approach, understanding that this isn't just about more cops and more discretionary time, because with more discretionary time means more arrests, means more engagement. That means we need more prosecutors, more jail space, we need more prevention. It is really a system-wide approach. And I will say this again, and I've always said it from the moment I've gotten here, that if we're going to have the tough conversations about where people can and can't be or should or shouldn't be based on what's safe is, I need to be able to say, you can't be here, but here's where you can go. And so that's a piece of this that is built into this system, is, is, is moving towards giving officers the tools and to free them up to do the things that you want them to do in their community, understanding that homeless services is a vital piece of the entire system that we're trying to put in place. So the thing I'd like to leave you with before I turn it over to Mauricio is, in my opinion, in my professional opinion, doing nothing is not an option. Status quo doesn't mean we remain the same. Even if we as a community decided we can live with the way things are now, the way things are now will not be that way a year from now, and certainly not two and three years from now. There's, there are examples all over this country of communities that didn't pay attention to these metrics that are now unrecoverable when it comes to trying to eradicate criminal behavior and livability and to increase livability. We're at a really critical point that we can unwind what we're doing now. We can get ahead, ahead, of, ahead of this and get our arms around that. But I, I feel strongly as a, as a law enforcement professional that if we don't do something now, we're going to really, really suffer in the future. So with that, I want to turn it over to Mauricio. All right, thanks, Chief. All right, good evening. Um, I'm going to review how the payroll tax might work as shown in attachment A of your council packet. A copy of this possible payroll tax structure is also at your tables. Let's start with the revenue requirement. As previously discussed, the ongoing funding needed at full ramp up is $22.8 million in FY19 dollars. The draft proposal also includes an additional $840,000 for downtown police currently funded by parking services, as recommended by the Community Safety Revenue Team. In order to estimate the payroll tax required to meet this need, we considered many factors including inflationary adjustments, reserve requirements, payroll growth, administrative costs, and tax collection rates. The draft proposal includes a payroll tax of 0.28% on the gross payroll of employers and 0.28% on the gross wages of employees. Those who are self-employed would be considered employers and thus would pay the employer tax only. It's proposed that the tax rate of 0.28% would remain flat 
and not exceed that amount over the seven year evaluation period, which you'll hear more about from Christy. A flat tax provides greater certainty for employers and employees than a tax that periodically increases. Community safety services are expected to ramp up over time and the proposed tax rate would also provide flexibility for services to ramp up faster when it's operationally feasible. Any excess payroll tax collected in the early years would remain in a separate dedicated fund for use in future years where there's more uncertainty in the current revenue projections. As you can see on the slide, a tax rate of 0.28% would cost an employer with annual gross payroll of $500,000 about $117 per month. For a full-time employee earning $12 per hour, which will be the minimum wage in Eugene when the payroll tax is implemented, the monthly cost would be $6. And for a full-time employee earning $20 per hour, the monthly cost would be $10. So to determine who the payroll tax would apply to, the driving factor is the physical location of a business. It doesn't matter where someone lives, it doesn't matter where the corporate office is located, and it doesn't matter where the paycheck comes from. If the physical location of a business falls within Eugene city limits, then the employer and employee payroll taxes would apply. For a business with multiple physical locations, both in and out of Eugene, the payroll taxes would only apply to those locations within city limits. And given that we cannot tax other governments, the employer payroll tax would not apply to federal, state, or local government agencies. However, those same government agencies would still be required to withhold and remit the employee payroll tax on behalf of their employees. Uh, please note that no exemptions are included in this draft proposal. Some potential exemptions previously, previously discussed include nonprofit employers and minimum wage employees. The draft proposal aligns with the community safety revenue team's recommendation to keep the tax structure as simple as possible. This approach also supports cost effective administration and eases the administrative burden on businesses. Ideally, the payroll tax implementation would occur on July 1st, 2020, after the initial round of bridge funding is, is, is exhausted. Although a number of factors will ultimately impact the implementation date, including the Department of Revenue's availability amongst other legislative priorities. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Christy to review the accountability measures of the draft proposal. Thanks, Maurizio. So with a $22.8 million annual ask comes a high level of accountability and responsibility in making sure that we're transparent and accountable for where those dollars are being spent, allocated, and how we're managing those. And that's something that actually we have experience in doing really well. And we think about the road fund dollars and things like that. So what, one of the things that's really important is the maintenance of the fund. And on attachment A that um, Maurizio mentioned, maintenance of fund basically means that None of these dollars, the dollars that are available right now for community safety services as of fiscal year 18, start of fiscal year 19 before the bridge funding was funded, is that those would stay in place. None of these new dollars would take away from what's already in place. We would maintain that level of service and we would build on that level of service. And so there's been some questions about that and we would want to make that very, very clear that there was no decline in the level of service that, or the level of funding that's going to the services that we have today. We would have the funds in what we refer to as lock, lock box in a specific account where we monitor that account and those dollars are allocated based on the purpose that they are intended to achieve and the outcomes that we're driving for. We would ask the city manager to establish a citizen advisory board. That citizen advisory board would provide an annual report. They would look at the outcomes, how well we're doing at achieving those. They would look at the way that the finance, the dollars are being allocated. And they would also, um, be able to review an independent audit that's completed by an external auditor. In addition, uh, what we hope is, is that that ongoing work that happens on the front end on an annual basis will help us understand where we're making progress, where we need to improve, but most importantly, that it's really clear to the community what we're using these dollars for and how we're working towards achieving outcomes that improve the quality of life, safety, and livability. The second part of this is that seven year period, um, 
which we have, um, have built in to really go through the full implementation of a lot of the things that the two chiefs talked about and trying to get some experience in how well those things are moving forward. We would have those annual reviews I just mentioned, and at the end of that period, council then would have an opportunity to take action. They would receive a report, a seven-year report, to um, provide a summary of all the work that's been done, and in addition, be able to get to hold uh, a public hearing to gather feedback from community members to understand how well things are working. After receiving that feedback, council would be able to provide direction on whether they not wanted to continue or stop. And all of that would happen before by June 30th of 2027. What you might see in attachment A is, is that there's an end period or a continuation of a tax period that starts July 1 of 2028. The reason for that is, is that we recognize is that you won't be able to shut off the spigot immediately. There's, there will be a lot in play if council decides that this isn't working and we're going to shift directions. And so we wanted to make sure that we have an appropriate, appropriate dollars available to ramp down the service. So at this point, I just want to remind you that we're not asking for any action uh, or decision making tonight. We're really looking forward to hearing your feedback and that the, count, the city manager will be returning with a recommendation within the next 30 days. And during that period, we're going to continue to seek feedback um, so that we can help inform the decision um, for the city manager's recommendation and for your consideration. Mayor, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much. And I have Mike in the queue and Greg and Betty. Anyone else? Okay. Chris? Okay, Mike, take it away. Thank you. This is unfortunately timed. Mm. <laughs> <clears throat> Mr. Manager, will you remind me how much was the library levy a couple of years ago? Two maybe. Uh, Two point seven million per year. And the parks levy and bond? I know the levy is 3.15 million. The bond in the neighborhood of 39. 39. Um, at the time, while being a, a very big fan of both of those services, I was the one vote against them because I thought we should have been doing this first. I'm not in favor of the funding mechanism still. This is no surprise. Um, I think it, it's unfair. It hits different folks disproportionately. Um, I think it's going to cause us some challenges with our friends in Springfield as well as well um, some unintended consequences. If it doesn't meet with stronger resistance of a campaign to, to stop it, and I think there's a better idea to fund it. And the, the challenge for me with the way we're going about this is that having put those other things first and out to the voters, they now can't be cut. It's not like we can prioritize this over the library levy or the parks levy. What is, for me, obviously more important that we do this work, that public safety is the first job of our community. So it leaves me in a really uncomfortable position with this because I really want to support the activity that is uh, would be funded with this, but I'd like to fund it in a different manner. And um, it's not a surprise to the manager, the chief, but I don't have an, uh, an alternative yet because I sense that my colleagues are willing to do this, and I, I think it will harm us to do it this way. Thank you. Okay, Greg. You know, I, I, I have to disagree with my friend and colleague, Mike, on this one. I, I think that... The priority here, um, to some degree, trumps the um, method, if you will. Um, I'll give you an anecdotal example. It, a couple of years ago, um, I had a situ growing situation on my street that required police response. And the response at the time that this began was calling a non-emergency number. Both myself and a number of, of, a number of other neighbors of mine did that. We got no response. Then the second time the situation happened, it was a party situation. There were 60 kids, young people, underage teenagers who were drunk, high, fighting in the street, a whole bit. 
I did not get get a response on the first call, second call, third call had to go to 911. By that time, the situation was out of control. We need to have responses on that lower level, even if it's a CSO responding, to be able to nip these kinds of situations in the bud because they're growing in our community. They're continuing to move forward and get out of control in ways that, um, you know, are going to have lasting damage in our community. And I think that, you know, we don't have a whole lot of mechanisms within our power to be able to fund and support this kind of level of public safety support and activity for our community. And I think that, you know, we have to make tough decisions sometimes. This is one of those tough decisions that I think are going to benefit the overall community in the long run. Okay. Oh, one, one question, though. I got, I got a little bit of time left. Um, Chief, uh, can you kind of quantify for us what the net effect of this investment would be on the system when you talk about you know, uh, non-emergency calls and mm -hmm. versus emergency call situations? I'll try, sir. Um, when we're talking about this particular proposal for community safety, specifically to Eugene Police Department, is it equates to 87 and a half FTE, roughly 55 of those are sworn positions. My commitment through this, understanding where the, the majority of the service lies is to increase our patrol staffing by a measurable amount to be able to start moving this trend in direction. But here's the caveat to that. When we, when we add staff and we start doing a better job answering calls for service, more people are gonna call for service. So there's a period of time where we're gonna stay really busy, we're gonna be arresting more people, and so I wanna be clear that one of the metrics you didn't hear me talk about is crime rate. You know, crime stats are gonna go down. Because in the early stages, they may actually go up a little bit just because we're doing a better job of catching and interdicting criminal behavior. But through the course of, of a, a normalization period and with the discretionary time and the proactive time officers will then achieve, that's when your crime stats start to get suppressed. And so I think the uh, through this, through this um, initiative, there's a lot of things we want to accomplish, but I think at the center of that is the backbone of your police department and every police department nationwide, which is your patrol division. You have to be able to have a robust patrol division that can answer emergency and non-emergency calls for service. And that metric, that single metric of how many of those we can get to, I think is going to be that, that data point that's going to give us an indication of success. And that's really where we're trying to move that trend in the right direction. Okay, Eddie. Thank you. Um, first, I was glad to hear the chief say that we need to be able to tell people where they can be as well as where they can't be which is go, gets back to our need for public shelters and day center downtown and so forth. Um, second, I, rare, in a rare occasion, I'll disagree with Mike about something. I think um, the funding of library services and um, what else was it? Parks. 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 Oh, those are those are safety measures, really. If people have other things to do, if they have recreational opportunities and opportunities for culture, any of those things are likely to decrease the need for law enforcement because people have other things to do. As for this method of of financing public safety, I'm very concerned about someone who makes $12 an hour paying $10 a month of extra fees. If you make that much money, you can't really afford to live even. And I, I still think that a lodging tax, <clears throat> I know you're going to say that doesn't get enough money, but I think it's a, a better way to raise more money. Um, it, 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 
causes people who use our services, use the parks and the streets and everything to help pay for, for services. Um, I think that we should try to lobby the state to let us use the lodging taxes we have the way we choose instead of just for advertising. And I think there are probably other ways, other ways we can raise money too, but I'm very concerned about this particular way. Thank you. Mayor, if I may, I just want to make sure that um, the $12 minimum wage rate is $6, not 10, I just want a month. Just, I mean, it's a small clarification, but I just want to make sure. Thank you. Yeah. Chris. Thank you. Um, appreciate the presentation. This is an extremely difficult subject. Um, and it's been a long time coming, which is what makes it so difficult. I was looking for the for the kind of central concept to to, to focus around, and, and the word that I kept coming back to was response and responsiveness. Um, I think it's been a couple of years since I mentioned before that a city's um, satisfaction is measured in its ability to respond to its citizens in, in, in any way, whether it's parks or libraries or police or, or fire or anything else. It's our responsiveness that indicates whether or not we are a city that people feel supported by. And so I think this gets at the heart of why we need to make significant improvements to our system. It is failing in its ability to respond. Um, and it's failing quickly and it's failing on an increasing scale and it will collapse eventually if we don't do something about it. So to me, the need is now and the need is emergent and the need has to be dealt with. It is not something that we can continue to discuss and talk about. We must do something now to head this off in order to become what we need to be. Two of the three focus areas that this council identified a couple of years ago as being principal areas for us to focus on um, are covered by this initiative. And so we can actually put our money where our mouth is in terms of whether or not we truly support these areas of, of focus. And I think we need to consider the fact that this proposal, and we looked at a lot of them. We literally looked at a lot of ideas. You've seen them before, we've seen them before, and we went through them one by one, and this is the only one that was going to collect the amount of money that needs to be collected in a way that ensures that as many people as possible have skin in the game. You don't want to say, well, I want them to pay, but I don't want them to pay. We are all affected by community safety, and this is the one that has the broadest ability to incorporate those people so everybody has a stake in it. And we tried to craft it so that if your income is low, your stake is also low. If your income is higher, your stake is higher. And that means we try to create a progressive nature to this. I think we need to find ways to not dwell on why we can't do something. You can't do it because of this. You can't do it because of that. And I think we need to turn that conversation around. And we, as a council, need to say, what can we do? What do we need to do? What must happen in order to deal with this very, very significant and serious issue? And I think this, after a lot of thought and a lot of conversation and a lot of consideration, is the proposal that I think has the best chance of being the can-do proposal and not the speech of can't. Okay, anybody else with a comment or a question? Alan. Yeah, um, I just wanted to comment that uh, through the wonders of our technology and our website, I'm actually able to uh, hear the entire council meeting while I was um, getting here from work. So I, I, I heard the entire presentation and your, and your um, comments before. Um, my comments on this particular issue are that I support the need and the package of services. I think the plan is very solid and the near need is very clear. Um, I'm not completely sure about the mechanism for funding this. Uh, it depends kind of on the details and how it's done. One of the Achilles heels, I think, of this is, is the flat. Uh, could be, it, depending on how we do it, is the flat rate. Um, it is not a progressive tax. It, uh, so one, that was one of the key arguments against the flat tax when we put up the service fee. And so uh, as we progress down this path, I, I hope we talk about other options like 
a variable rate uh, that makes this more progressive. So, um, and I'm also on the fence as to whether or not the council should act on this or send it out to a vote, but I, I, mm -hmm. I am intrigued with the idea of the city manager going out and building more community support. We need a lot of public engagement in this. We need a lot of build community support around this. I think it's a good plan. The need is clear. So I think that that's not a very uh, difficult task to do. Um, so we need to engage the businesses and the, and, and the nonprofits and the community around seeing that this actually makes sense and that, that um, it's well thought out, which I think it is, and, and that it's worth buying. Um, I think that's the, the essence of whenever we try to do one of these things, is this worth buying? Do we get what we're paying for? Do we have the assurances around that? I think we can build that in too. And are we going to get the things that make our community safer and more livable? And I think the answer to those questions are yes. Um, so I think there's still more work to do and before we get to where we need to be uh, making a final decision. Okay. Mike, second round. Thank you, Mayor. I want to take every single opportunity to agree with my friend Alan anytime it presents itself. Thank so you. I agree with what Alan just said entirely um, for some different reasons, but uh, like Greg and like Alan, like others, I in agree entirely that we're getting closer with this discussion to the service level that's required. We absolutely do need that. I would get there a different way, but, but we absolutely do need to be delivering that service level. And I have put forward a proposal that does pay for it. But at the very least, if we're going to create a new mechanism, a brand new mechanism that doesn't apply to everyone here, um, I think we darn well better put it in front of the people of the community to approve of. Because it's as a brand new mechanism, I, I think we will be voting on it one way or another, and we would be wiser to be presenting the argument from council than to allow someone else to bring it to the ballot. Thank you. Okay. Any other, any other comments? I, uh, yeah, go ahead, Emily. Could you tell us what your other idea is, Mike? Yeah, absolutely, but I've said it a bunch of times. Well, could you that tell there me are, Sure, there are, if the mayor will allow here, I kind of used up my time. I see the manager sitting up straight here in my <laughs> peripheral you view. Know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> is this the annex thing? Yes. Okay. There are 22,000 folks who live in this community that aren't members of the city of Eugene. And they don't pay city of Eugene taxes, and they should. And we should welcome them with an opportunity. We should welcome them into the city as a part of our family with a deal that a appeals to them because we have it. We've talked about it and we can do it. Um, and as it was presented to us, this revenue is needed on an incremental basis, not all at once. And thus, as people annex into the city in the Santa Clara and River Road area, because the deal is too good to say no to, the revenue that would come in would be matching the same level of expenditure and the manager and I differ on the amount of revenue that is potentially there, and I can make a pretty good case too. So, so what uh, we will do because I I do think um, part what I uh, do agree with you on on this is that um, the unincorporated portions of River Road and Santa Clara I think would be welcomed into our community and that would be fabulous. But as part of uh, prior to that 30 days, we'll also send out some of the specifics on the financing. So we may disagree on the actual financing pieces of this, but we will send out the analysis that uh, we have done in the past and refresh that and bring that back. Whose analysis, if you don't mind my asking? It was uh, Larry Hill at the time. You might remember he was part of our finance team. And a, and a wonderful man and a great state senator when he was there, but I would think the numbers probably need some serious... So we'll update. refresh them. We'll yeah. refresh them and bring them current, and then uh, we will provide that ahead of that 30 days so everybody will have the same information. We're happy to do that. Thank you, and you're welcome, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Mike. Uh, I have one little question. The total funding needed is 22.8 plus the 840... 840,000, which way is that going? Or does the 22.8 now give the 840 back to the parking? Or is that in addition? Does that make any sense? <laughs> well, 
you would take the 22.8 does not include the 840. So we would add 840 on top of that, thus alleviating the need for parking to transfer. So the 840, which is now being funded by parking services, would in the future be funded by the payroll tax. Okay, great. So it doesn't go up to 23.640. The need goes back to parking because it's covered by this new funding. Yes, and just for clarity, the 0.28% uh, already accounts for that 840. So that wouldn't adjust by putting that 840 into there. And then what does parking get to do with that 840? Uh, you know, ultimately the council choose, gets to appropriate dollars. And so <laughs> that'll be a part of a council conversation for sure. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for the presentation. I, I think the payroll is certainly the best that we could come up with that could happen in a timely manner. So I hope people will understand and appreciate it. I know we're going to come out with more detailed um, explanation of where the money will go. And uh, I really hope that people will take the time to consider our need and that this could fulfill it. Thank you. Hey, Alan, another comment? Yeah, a long time ago when we were doing um, some transportation funding packages, one of the statistics I remember hearing was that 50% of the people that work in the city of Eugene do not live in the city of Eugene. Um, although those people still use not only our transportation system, but they use our community safety system and they benefit from it. Um, so I'm wondering if that's still the statistic or if we can get an updated version of that that wasn't done by Larry Hill. <laughs> Yeah, we looked, uh, we looked into that. Uh, the census puts out a report. Uh, it was the last we had was 2015 data. Um, and it showed that of the people who work in Eugene, about 55%. So you quoted 50%. It's now, at least as of 2015, it's 55% of people come in from outside of city limits. Yeah, the thing that intrigues me about the payroll tax is that you then capture those people, maybe not all of the employers, but the employees that benefit from it, uh, and most of the employers, um, and you, you capture those people. And I, I like the nexus between who pays and, and what services you get. In, in this case, all of those people that don't pay city taxes are getting a service that they actually end up getting for free. So all those people that actually are in the city of Eugene should, uh, should like this plan from that perspective because it spreads it out uh, among uh, uh, people that wouldn't necessarily pay this if we were just limited to the residents of Eugene, as opposed to the people who work in Eugene. Right, right. Did you have another comment, Mike? Yeah, I just a couple little things. Number one, when did Larry Hill leave the city of Eugene? That was when I started, so four years ago. And that's the last time that information was updated that I thought we studied as a part of this? I don't know as we, when you say we studied as a part of this. I thought that the idea of the annexation of River Road and Santa Clara as a revenue source was discussed as a part of this committee's work. So it wasn't even discussed. Nope. I see. Um, <laughs> the other piece, that's unfortunate, really. Um, the other piece is that what we brought up uh, in the last time we talked about this was the state payroll along with nonprofit payroll represents a third of those who work in the city of Eugene. And if we exempt firms with X number of employees or less, be that 20 or whatever we end up doing, plus those who are um, making under a certain amount per hour, we're going to end up with quite a bit less than half the people who live here paying. And I can't imagine how anyone could consider that just under the circumstances as well. So thank you. Okay, any other any other comments? You are, okay, go for it, Emily. Uh, the nonprofits are included. And uh, what was the other one you said? Those are both included. At the moment. The government, yeah. So, but as we're looking at it now, that's what we have on the table. We did talk about taking out nonprofits and uh, lower wage earners and decided it was cleaner and fairer to include everybody. So that's what we are promoting. Thanks. 
Thank you. So I just want to add a couple of comments on my own. It, it seems to me that one of the values that came out of this uh, task, this committee, uh, the revenue uh, committee, was the idea that this would be broad and shallow, that this would have a tax that would be a, applied broadly and simply, but it would be shallow so that the impact would not be profound on anyone. And I think that's an important value given that the value that we get out of a robust community safety program is deep. So it feels to me that you know what we're asking for in relation to what we're about to get through this is deep. And you know, it, you sort of wish you could uh, adjust the clock a little bit because the EPD is under a lot of pressure to show some success with the 8.6 million bridge funding in order to really reinforce the message here. And I think has really stepped out. I think the street crimes unit in an effort to really very quickly show uh, what, what a boost in funding can do and I think you know, it's a very important for council to remember that in approving bridge funding, you want that bridge to lead somewhere. And there has to be a landing on the other side. And the landing on the other side that was, that was the foundation of that bridge funding was that on the other side, there would be a sustainable funding source. And uh, so I think it's really important not to forget that. And I just one more quick point. Uh, we have concurrently with this a lot of work going on through the TAC report around how we address homelessness. It's very clear from the public's perspective <clears throat> that the challenges of people living in our public space and public safety are intertwined issues. And so we are endeavoring to address this very complex issue with two different but very coordinated efforts. One in terms of responding to the needs for shelter and services and moving into housing and the other the need to responding to the pub, to the safety issues, both for the people who are unsheltered and for the people who are sheltered of sharing that public space. So I think it's really important to keep our eye on where, where are we trying to get here? We're trying to get to a community that is safe for everybody and where people have shelter and people who need to be addressed uh, in terms of services, get those services. People who need to go through a criminal justice system, go through that system. So just remembering that's where we're going and uh, that we all pay into it and we all benefit deeply from it. So that's my, thank you. Uh, Chris, go ahead. Yeah, actually something that might link what um, Emily was talking about and what Alan was talking about is the notion of how can we try to do what we can um, to minimize the impact on the lowest income people. And the proposal that we brought was a flat rate because that was the simplest and the most straightforward. But I, we also considered variable rates. I mean, there is a possibility to look at um, what the impacts of variable rates might be. And if a uh, variable rate could be incorporated in some way to try to minimize the impact on the lowest wage workers and somehow mitigate a little bit, I, I think it's worth doing some additional number crunching on and take a look and, and see what the impact might be. Um, I think the mechanism still has the benefit of being the one that covers the most amount of people, which is what I would want to retain. Um, but figuring out a way to uh, reduce the impact on the people who would suffer the most um, because of their low wage, it's a worthwhile conversation, so we can certainly have that piece of it. So you may be able to accomplish both by looking at what a variable rate kind of position might be. Okay. Yes, Alan. So, yeah, I, thanks for saying that, Chris. I, I, I agree with that. I think trying to make this uh, more progressive would be helpful. Um, it, can we get that analysis done, bring back some options about how this might be done on a variable rate based on income? Yeah, what uh, we have uh, done is taken a look at if we, uh, for example, for minimum wage employees, if we were to uh, set them at a lower than 0.28 and keep that consistent, that would be one example of how we could do that. And so that could be set at something less than 0.28 as a minimum wage employee. Yeah, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be graduated. It's like it, it's no, I think what... step thing. Well, I think what we would... or something like that. Uh, yeah, although I think if we want something the simple, I think what do we... What do we the, the simplicity of 0.28 across the board, starting from day one through day whatever, uh, makes it really simple. If we were to want to say, okay, for a minimum wage rate, we could just say, let's set that at 
two, for example, as a, as a point point two eight or whatever the number is, and then just keep that one the same all the way through. And that way, there's simplicity to that also. Yeah. And, but you and you've created that that progressive piece. Yeah. For in example. my experience, progressivity in these kinds of things is more important than simplicity. Right, and that would set that would be a progressive rate. So, but we get that, and we'll have some information back coming back. Straight line. Okay, we're ready. Thank you very much. I think that wraps this up, and we have a we'll adjourn and reconvene at seven thirty. Thank you.